Well, it's certainly good to be able to certainly good to be able to assemble on this Lord's Day Eve. We're glad that you're here. We appreciate you coming our way. Hope you profit by being with us in our study. Do you remember the song that Frank Sinatra sang called That's Life? Let me read you the lyrics and see if you can relate in any way to it. It says, that's life, that's life. That's what all the people say. You're riding high in April, shot down in May. But I know I'm going to change that tune when I'm back on top, back on top in June. I said, that's life, that's life. And as funny as it may seem, some people get their kicks stomping on a dream. But I don't let it, let it get me down, because this fine old world, it keeps spinning around. I've been a puppet, a pauper, a pirate, a poet, a pawn, and a king. I've been up and down and over and out, and I know one thing, each time I find myself flat on my face, I pick myself up and get back in the race. That's life, that's life. I tell you, I can't deny it. I thought of quitting, baby, but my heart just ain't gonna buy it. And if I didn't think it was worth one single try, I'd jump right on a big bird and then I'd fly. I've been a puppet, a pauper, a pirate, a poet, a pawn, and a king. I've been up and down and over and out. I know one thing, each time I find myself lying flat on my face, I pick myself up and get back in the race. That's life, that's life. That's life and I can't deny it. Many times I've thought of cutting out, but my heart won't buy it. But if there's nothing shaking coming this here July, I'm gonna roll myself up in a big ball and die my my. I don't know if you've ever felt that way or not, but that song is kind of depressing to me. But you know, Solomon felt to some degree exactly that way about life. In the book of Ecclesiastes, he goes on a journey. And you might say that the book of Ecclesiastes is a journal of that particular journey as he's trying to figure out what it is he can do in his life that will bring him some lasting profit. And what he, what he finds out is that when he goes down the various roads of life seeking the answer to that question, he comes up empty every single time. Everything that he tries finds out that it's all empty. It's, it's all nothing. It's a vanity. A vanity is like striving after the wind. And what he tries to find out is explained in verse 3 of chapter 1. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? Now that's the question that he's trying to figure out. And let me suggest to you that when he goes through the book and the journey he's on, that he is on a journey testing, trying to figure it out. He experienced different things, but not for the purpose of experiencing them by themselves or alone. He's trying to find out. He's trying to figure out. He's making a test of life to figure out what is best and what is right in life. And when he gets through, he comes up with this conclusion that life is disgusting. It's just disgusting to him. Now, not living, but life. He sees so many bad things in his life and so many troubles and toils and, and so many problems that can't be worked out. And there's nothing you can do in this life that's going to benefit beyond this life. And so when he comes to his conclusion, he's disgusted with life. And let me suggest to you three things that Solomon did, and I believe he wrote the book, Solomon did on his journey. And the first thing that Solomon did was to test life. He wanted to figure out what is good that I can do that's gonna be helpful to me. And this is recorded in the first 11 verses. And test number one is simply pleasures of life. And if you have your Bible, look at verse 1 of chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you. Now, please mark that down. I will test you. He's not going through pleasures just for the sake of enjoying the pleasure, but he's going, running a test. He's trying to figure this out. What is good to do? And he says, I will test you with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. But surely this also was vanity. So he gives us his conclusion here in verse 1 of chapter 2. It's all vanity. It's all emptiness. There's no real lasting benefit. There's no lasting profit. There's no lasting good that can come from mirth and all the things that are involved in pleasure. So he says, a set of laughter, madness, and of mirth, 
what does it accomplish? I search in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom. Now he's going to gratify himself with wine. He, he doesn't get drunk just to get drunk, but he's using his wisdom. Now Solomon, you must remember, was blessed of God with the greatest wisdom of any man who's ever lived, excepting the Lord, and God also gave him great wealth. Now that enabled him to carry out this test because he had such wealth that no one has ever had since as much, nor the wisdom, certainly no one has had that other than our Lord. And so we can say that he's the wisest man and one of the richest men that ever lived. And so he said, I want you to understand that my wisdom was intact. And he said, how do I hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under the earth all the days of their lives? Now again, he's expressed in verse one, his conclusion, that after the search in life through folly and through pleasure, he finds that it's all just emptiness. It's nothing of lasting value whatsoever. And so therefore, that's test number one. Now test number two involves pleasures uh, through work that he accomplishes. Now look at verse four of chapter two. I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards. Now, when you think about Solomon building houses, he had houses according to what he wanted and anything and everything he wanted, he was able to accomplish because of his wealth and his wisdom. He said, I made myself gardens and orchards. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. Now, when you think of a garden, you think of flowers. But when they thought of gardens, they thought of trees. So he planted all these gardens of trees, the beautiful trees and so forth, and he made pools of water to water all those trees. And he acquired in verse seven, male and female servants and had servants born in my house. Yet I had greater possession of herds and flocks than all who were before me in Jerusalem. So he had more than anyone ever had before. And he's running this test, trying to figure out if it's any lasting benefit to any of it. I gathered for myself silver and gold and special treasures of kings and of the provinces. So the kings and provinces that were under Solomon's control, they had to pay tribute to him and he got wealth from them as well. He said, I acquired male and female singers, the lights of the sons of men and musical instruments of all kinds. And so he's trying to figure out through the work that he is doing uh, to build up his kingdom, to establish his wealth, to establish himself in life by his projects, if there's anything lasting of value and benefit to all of that. And he expresses his conclusion as you look at that. But let me, before I emphasize that, let me emphasize that when you think about pleasure in life, you need to realize that the Bible speaks about those who love pleasure. And when you love pleasure, and that is your main goal, to have fun in life. And a lot of people have that as their goal. You see on TV, on commercials and so forth, these people who are out having parties, they might be having a tailgate party or some party of some sort, and they're drinking their beer and wine and having a good time and getting all the gusto they can out of life because that's what life's all about. And you, you find all of that happening. But when you think about those who love pleasure and they put serving the Lord on the back burner, or take him off the stove altogether because they're not concerned about the Lord. They're concerned about having a good time. Well, what about those who love pleasure rather than loving God? Well, first of all, it's a selfish thing. It's selfish because a person is trying to satisfy self. They're not concerned about what God wants in their life. They're concerned about satisfying self. How can I satisfy myself? What can I do pleasurably that's going to make me joyful and happy in life? And a person that way becomes selfish. They become selfish because they're looking out for self. And a lot of times when you do that, what happens is, is that you mess up your relationship because you, you're more concerned about self than others. And so your relationships go to pot. And the person's having a big time, but they're losing their relationships in life because they're serving self. They're, they're trying to figure out what to do. You know, there are a lot of people who have done this. Uh, they may get a fishing boat or rod and reel and go out fishing and, and desert their family or may play golf or a lot of things that you can think about that people might do as pleasurable. And they're doing that, number one, in life. Rather than to focus on the really important spiritual matters, they're concerned about having a good time. But pleasure is destroying of joy 
and ignores the total being of a person. Now you take the person that relies upon alcohol to get their pleasure in life. You know what happens when that happens? I'm told and I've seen it happen. Never experienced it myself. But those who rely upon alcohol to bring pleasure in their life, they have to have more and more as time goes by because there's a period of diminishing returns. The alcohol that a person might drink one day is one thing, but he needs more the next day and the next day and he becomes an alcoholic. And that which he thought was going to bring him pleasure is that which ensnares him because he becomes addicted to it. And it may be drugs, it may be sex, it may be any number of things that a person has as pleasure in their life that they're seeking and they become enamored with it, they become engrossed with it to the point that their joy is gone and they have totally ignored their spiritual being. So that's what happens when people are absorbed with pleasure in good times and without thinking about God in this, this world as well. And the summary that he gives in verse 9 through 11 is this. This is the summary conclusion he comes to. He says, So I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem, and my wisdom remained with me. Now, nobody can excel him because he is the greatest. He's the greatest king. He has the greatest possessions. He has the greatest wisdom. And when he tells us this, it tells us that what we need to understand is that if we wanted to take the same journey, we'd come to the same conclusion. We can't excel what he had. We cannot excel his wisdom. And so why would we think we need to take that journey ourselves to find out if Solomon's telling the truth? He's telling the truth. Because you can't be greater than he was as far as his wisdom. You can't be greater than he was as far as his wealth was concerned. And he says, I excel more than all who were before me, and my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. Now a person might think, well, you know, if I had all the money in the world, and I could go out and I could experiment like Solomon did and try to figure all this out, we don't have to do that. Because Solomon excelled everyone in that regard. And he didn't keep anything from himself that he wanted. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. Anything he wanted to do, he did. And he says, for my heart rejoiced in my labor, and this was my reward for my labor. Now the enjoyment that he got was his reward. It was not a lasting reward. It was not a lasting benefit. But that was all he got from all of the labor that he, that he had. I looked on all my works in verse 11 that my hands had done. And on the labor in which I had told, and indeed this was vanity and grasping for the wind, there was no profit under the sun. There's no lasting benefit. Now again, you can't excel what he did. You can learn by his experience, and if you're a wise person, that's what you'll do. You'll learn from Solomon's experience that there's nothing in this world that you can do as far as pleasure is concerned, as far as work is concerned, this of any lasting benefit. And the benefit comes from the enjoyment along the way. Now, let me suggest to you that when we think about that, that Solomon hated life. He hated it. He was disgusted with it. Look again as we go back at verse 12 of chapter 2. Then I turned it to myself to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can man do who succeeds the king? If another king comes along, he can't do more than Solomon did. He can't go through the test that he went through and come up with any different results. He cannot excel what Solomon did, only what he's already done. And I saw that wisdom excels folly. It's better to go through life as a wise person than a fool. It excels folly as light excels darkness. Now, the wise man's eyes are in his head. The wise man's eye, eye sees where he's going and works with caution and care. The fool, on the other hand, walks in darkness. He doesn't know where he's going. He doesn't walk with caution. How many folks are there who are living their lives that way? They're not concerned about wise actions and wise things. They're doing what they do to gratify the flesh. They're doing what they do to have pleasure in life and fun. But they, they're blinded and they don't see. Yet I myself perceive that the same thing happens to them all. Now this is what really made him disgusted with life. Not with living. But with what he saw in life, what he experienced in life, the troubles, the problems, the toils along the way, this is what caused him great heartache, that the same event happens to them all. What happens to the wise man versus the fool in the final accounting of all things in life? 
they both die. And he says, so I said in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it also happens to me. Then why was I the more wise? What benefit did I have by being wise when the fool out here doesn't have any wisdom and acts in a foolish way? I was acting with wisdom. I was applying my wisdom, and yet I didn't have any benefit in the final outcome because both of us died. Both of us died. Then I said in my heart, this also is vanity. For there's no more remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever. You know, when people die in life, it doesn't matter whether they're wives or fools, that people generally don't understand. They don't know anything about them. You go into a cemetery, for example, and unless you know a particular person that's buried in that cemetery, you don't know anybody else there. And there may be hundreds or thousands of people buried there. You have no idea anything about those people. Since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come, how does a wise man die? As a fool. Therefore I hated life, because the work done under the sun was distressing to me, for all his vanity and grasping for wind. He said, I hated life. When he went down that road looking at wisdom and folly, he saw that it's better to be wise than it is to be a fool. It's better to walk in wisdom with your eyes open than to walk as a fool with your eyes shut without any concern for care and how you should live your life. And he said there's better to do that, but in that final outcome, everything's going to work out the same. And he goes on to emphasize, <clears throat> is toil worthwhile? That's his test number four. Is it worthwhile that I've expended all the effort, all the time, and all the trouble to do what I've done? Well, let's go back and look at verse 18. But I hated all my labor, in which I had toiled on the sun, because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. Now Solomon said, I've worked hard. I've accomplished a lot. I've made a lot of good projects and built a lot of things. But I'm going to die, and I'm going to leave it to someone, and I don't know whether the person I'm going to leave it to is going to be a wise man or a fool. He didn't work for it. He didn't earn it. It doesn't mean anything to him like it does to me. He said, and who knows whether he'll be a wise or a, or a fool. Yet he will rule over all my labor, which I've toiled, and which I have shown myself wise in the sun. This is also vanity. Therefore my heart turned and despised of all the labor in which I had toiled on the sun. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom, knowledge, and skill, yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This is also a vanity and a great evil. I've known of people who worked hard in their lives, and they accomplished a lot, and they had a lot of, a lot of money built up, and they died and left it to some heir, and the heir had spent it in a foolish way. I had a lawyer tell me years ago, who was a Christian, he said, if someone inherits a lot of money, they ought to just spend it as quick as they can. They didn't earn it, it doesn't mean anything to them. And so therefore, just go ahead and spend it. For what has a man from all his labor and for the striving of his heart which is toiled under the sun? For all his days are sorrowful and his work burdensome. Even the night his heart takes no rest. This is also vanity. He said, what, what profit is there? He said, the man that works hard and he accomplishes a lot and builds up a lot of money and a lot of wealth. But he said he, he takes no rest at night. It reminds me of the farmer that I talked to years ago when I was in a meeting elsewhere. And he was a very successful farmer. And he was telling me about the fact, he said, if I had my life to live over, instead of being a farmer, accumulating the wealth that I've accumulated, he said, I'd get a 40-hour work week and I wouldn't be saddled with this farm whatsoever. He said, I can't sleep at night because I'm worried someone's going to steal my equipment or is, is going to harm my crops or something of that nature. And he couldn't rest because he was worried about all his wealth and somebody taking it. He was worried somebody might take one of his children and, and call for a ransom. And so therefore, that's what he said in regard to everything. Toil in life. Well, what we need to realize is that wealth can be a real hindrance to us because you can't take it with you. He brings that out in verse 18. You can't take your wealth worth, you can't take your wealth with you. He said, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna leave it to someone else. You can't take it with you. And he says you can't protect it. He brought that out in verse 19 and 20. You can't protect your wealth. You can't protect your wealth against thieves and those who would steal from you and the things that happen that you can't anticipate. And he says you can't enjoy it as you should. Because you can't even sleep at night. Because of the many things that go with being wealthy. So, he hated life. Now, what's the third thing that Solomon did 
that really brings all this together and gives us an understanding of what we need to do in life. And the third thing is, Solomon accepted life. Look at your Bible again as we look at verse 24. Nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink, that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. So that's the first thing. He said, you can't do anything better than to enjoy your life as you live it. This also I saw was from the hand of God. God has given all of us the material blessings of life. We can eat, drink, and enjoy life. And he says this over and over through the book. He hates life, not that he hates living, but he hates what life is. He hates what it brings to us. He hates the frustration. He hates the problems and troubles and toils all around him. And he couldn't change any of it, but that's just the way it was. He said you need to enjoy life and realize it's from the hand of God. For who can eat or drink or who can have enjoyment more than I? Again, that's what I mentioned a moment ago. For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to man who is good in his sight. But to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give to him who is good before God. This is also a vanity and a grasping after the wind. Solomon accepted life. He went through life, testing, trying to figure out what's the best way to go. What's going to bring me some lasting benefit, some lasting profit? And he came down with a big zero. In life, nothing in this life will bring you lasting benefit and joy as far as material wealth and pleasures are concerned. They're all like grasping for the wind to find anything lasting of benefit. And what you need to realize is that God gives us these things. They're just temporary. They're just, we didn't bring anything in the world. We didn't, won't take anything out. But God in, gives us these things as blessings and we need to enjoy life. And let me suggest about three different lessons and the lesson to be yours. Number one, we need to draw the conclusion that we need to learn to be content. I don't know how many times young people in our time want the blessings that their parents have right now. Blessings that took them years to accumulate, they want it right now. And that's just not just to young people, it's to anyone. Anyone who's absorbed, anyone who is filled with the desire to have more and more and more. It's like the multimillionaire was asked one time, how much money is enough? How much money do you need to have enough? He said, just a little bit more. And so that's the way people are. We need to learn contentment. Listen to what Paul said in Philippians 4, beginning at verse 11. Not that I speak in regard to need, but I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Paul had learned to be content in whatever state he was in. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I've learned to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, when you bring God in the picture and realize that your purpose in life is to serve him, to fear him and keep his commandments, as the writer said in chapter 12, 13, and 14, when you realize that your goal and purpose in life is to seek God and his kingdom first, as Matthew 6, 33 says, then you realize that the material things of life are passing away. They're to be enjoyed if, if we can and while we can, but they're not going to be here forever. We're not going to be here forever. And so therefore, I can do all things through Christ. Christ will enable us to live a life of contentment where we don't have to have everything. He says, nevertheless, you've done well that you shared them out of stress. I want you to notice what Paul said in 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Timothy, I should say, chapter 6, beginning at verse 6. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. How many people are there that are living their lives totally focused on material things, totally focused on this world, totally concerned about how to good to have a good time, not concerned about God, not concerned about His will for their life, and in doing so, they don't have the godliness with contentment, and it's described here as great gain. A person who's a godly person is a person who has the true gain in life because they really have in focus the reality of life and the reality is that we're going to face God in judgment. The reality is that we're in a training period, testing period now. The reality is we're all pilgrims and sojourners as the Bible describes God's people through the book of God. And it goes on to say in verse 7, we brought nothing to the world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. We can't carry anything with us. 
I've often wondered about people who are so caught up in wanting things and acquiring material wealth and so forth and when they're older, older people going to law to get their share and all the things they're concerned about and if they're of advanced age it really amazes me what are they so, so concerned about why do they want to gain all these material wealth and blessings when they know they're old and they know they can't live that much longer in life and yet they want to run over people if necessary to get what they want they, they want to grab as much as they can and they want to accumulate and they're going to die and they can't take a bit of it with them there are no pockets in a shroud have you ever seen a hearse with a U-Haul trailer going behind it? You won't, because there's no such thing. And he says, you didn't bring it into the world, and you won't take anything with you when you die. And having food and clothing, with these we should be content. For those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and in many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. You know, you see this every day on the news. You see people getting in trouble because they desired riches. They were willing to extort. They were willing to be dishonest. They were willing to do things that were against the law, thinking they could get away with it, but they were trying to accumulate the wealth. And they accumulate it, and what good does it do them? Because they're in trouble. It happens all the time. The love of money, in verse 10, is a root of all kinds of evil. All kinds of evil, from which some have strayed, even those who were Christians, strayed from the faith. Now that knocks in the head the idea you can't fall from grace, you can't fall from the faith because these did. Why? In their greediness. They were so greedy, they didn't learn to be content. We need to learn that lesson. Pierce themselves through with many sorrows. And we need also to <clears throat> enjoy the righteous life. The second lesson we need to learn. The Bible tells us in James 1 and verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow, which is cast from turning. The Apostle Peter makes the statement in 1 Peter 3, 10 through 12, that is quoted from the Psalms 34, 11 through 22. Let me just read the, what Peter said in 1 Peter 3, beginning in verse 10. For he who would love life and see good days. Now Solomon was disgusted with life. He didn't have the New Testament like we do. He didn't have the example of Christ. He didn't have the death of the Lord. He didn't have the resurrection of our Lord. He didn't have the gospel that you and I know about. But he learned to serve God in his younger years at least. He turned away from God. His wives, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines and they turned his heart away from God. But before that, he brought God in the picture and he said, he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. If you want to love life and see good days, learn to control your tongue. James 1.26 says, the man who can bridle his tongue can control his whole body. If a man can't do that, his religion is vain. If you can't control your tongue, the Bible says your religion is not worth a nickel. And he says, his lips from speaking to see. The second thing he says, let him turn away from evil. Don't pursue things that are wrong. Do that which is good. He says in this third thing, and then the last one, let him seek peace and pursue it. That's what's going to bring you peace. That's what bring your joy in life. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now that's the life of the righteous person. Now how does a person become a righteous person? Well, Romans 1, 16 and 17 tells us that the gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation. In verse 17, for it, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as written, the just shall live by faith. So the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. Somebody says, is that talking about the fact that God's a righteous being? No, the Jews knew that, and the people that Paul wrote knew that. God is a righteous being, but that verse is not saying that. It tells us God's means of being right, of being righteous, is revealed in the gospel. And in Romans 6, 17 and 18, God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. Now when were they made free from sin? Not by their faith alone, but when they obeyed from the heart. So they had to obey from the heart the form of teaching. What was that form of teaching? 
Romans 6, 3 through 5, when they were baptized, they were buried with Christ. They were raised up from the watery grave of baptism, a new creature, because their sins had been washed away. That old man of sin had been buried, a new man emerged, and that new man was now a Christian, a child of God. So that's how a person becomes a righteous person, and that's what we need to do as we live our respective lives. And lastly, we need to prepare ourselves for eternity. And there's, the way that you do that is, number one, you get yourself right with God by becoming a Christian. And then secondly, you live faithful unto death that you might receive the crown of life. First Corinthians 15, 58 says that if we're children of God, be faithful. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is in vain in the Lord. So we have two options. We can live our lives for the flesh. We can live our lives for pleasure. We can live our lives doing what we want to do in a selfish way and die and leave it all behind and face God ill-prepared and unprepared. Or we can live our lives with joy as a, as a Christian, a child of God, being right because we're cleansed by the blood of Christ when we obey the gospel, live faithful unto death, and receive the crown of life which never fades away. That's the life of the Christian. That's the life of the child of God. That's the life of joy that we have presented in the Word of God. And we have that because of what Jesus did for us. And if you're here tonight and you need to respond to the gospel of Christ, we bid you come while we stand and while we sing.